The fact of the matter is, all you see is light. And so when you think about it like that, you don't see the beautiful velvet chair. You don't see the amazing painting behind the host. You don't even see the food. What you see is the light that comes out of the, the fixtures that we specify that hits and bounces off of all those items and then back into your eye. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm excited to chat with the partner and design principal at Focus Lighting, Brett Anderson. Focus Lighting is an award-winning professional architectural lighting design firm located in New York City. The Focus Lighting team's creative process is informed by a combined experience in theater, architecture, and design, and they create lighting design solutions for pretty much anything that has lighting, including hotels, resorts, retail, restaurants, museums, nightclubs, offices, and private residences around the world. I'm excited to learn more about Brett's role in the firm and to chat with our first ever lighting designer on the show. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Brett Anderson. Okay, kids, all the way from New York City, we've got Brett Anderson. Brett, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hi, Josh. Thanks for having me. Well, we have lots to talk about today, and I always like starting with origin stories. Uh, and I understand that your origin story was almost as an astronaut or a pilot, <laughs> maybe <laughs> didn't start out as a lighting designer. So I'm curious what uh, created as in young Brett this desire to uh, feature or uh, to chase after the world of lighting design. Well, it was probably pretty evident, actually, in hindsight, it was pretty evident that I might end up in architecture and, and, and in design. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a little town, West Haven, Connecticut, and, um, you know, uh, only child of a, of a stay at home um, single mom. Uh, so, you know, I, I had a good amount of friends, but, you know, you spend a lot of time alone when you're an only child. And so <laughs> you end up doing things like um, playing with Legos. And I probably had 3000 Legos or something like that. And I would build things. And, and if I didn't have enough Legos to build what I wanted to build, I would start creating new things. You know, I was, I was, like you mentioned, I was kind of into space and I wanted to be an astronaut. So, you know, I, I remember kind of building a, a, a launch pad, but I didn't have enough Legos to make the rocket. So, you know, I, I, I grabbed the, my, actually my grandmother's, uh, you know, curlers and I started assembling things to make something <laughs> look like a rocket. And, you know, that was, Kind of, that sort of creativity and and ex exploration was something I was kind of doing at a young age. Um, you know, fast forward um, in high school, I uh, kind of stumbled across um, theater, um, and I took a speech class. and the And the teacher ended up being the the teacher who was in charge of our drama program at the high school. And pretty quickly, I found myself um, you know running soundboard, uh, helping with scenery and and uh, lighting, of course, and even had a few stints on stage, um, which was fairly short lived. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, a, pre, for the first time in my life had a, had a very kind of focused um, uh, passion about uh, what I wanted to do. And so, you know, I need, need to make a decision what I was going to major in when I went to college, um, decided to, to, to major in theatrical design. Um, I thought my mom was going to have a heart attack uh, when I announced that. Um, but she was super supportive um, and uh, ended up getting a degree in sort of general theater design. But during that process, I, I, I learned to and discovered that light was pr a really amazing medium to, to work in. And so um, went ahead and uh, actually got a master's degree, went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh um, and, you know, did things like I was working in, in regional theaters and, and summer stock theater at that time. And I was actually met my wife uh as we were both intern lighting interns at williamstown theater festival up in massachusetts you know and i i, I met a lot of design professionals people you know to people who were working on and off broadway um and i decided to make a go of it and i was and i moved to new york um uh, and fully intending to 
um, you know, try to make it on and off Broadway. Um, and literally, I, I graduated from school um, uh, from Carnegie Mellon. I moved to New York. About two or three weeks later, I got a call from my professor saying, hey, I've got a friend. He runs an architectural lighting design firm, and he needs a draftsman. Uh, he's got a big project. Uh, give him a call. So I give him a call. You know, I need money. I need I need a gig. Uh, and, um, you know, 27 years later, here I am. Uh and, you know, started as a junior designer, um, kind of learning the ropes and worked my way all the way up to where I am today. Um, so it's been a fun ride. Um, Did you know early on that you would be interested in kind of elevating to a principal design kind of role or being a partner in the firm? Or, you know, was this just a job in between theater gigs? That's how it started. Um, you know, I totally thought this was just a few months and I was going to get back to back to doing theater. But um, as I think a lot of people who try to make a go of of the theater life, it's it's a hard one. Uh, and, you know, there was definitely an appeal to a regular paycheck. Um, and and frankly, we were doing work um, that was um very much in keeping with sort of the the style and and the approach of the theatrical lighting that I had sort of grown up um, learning about. And so mm -hmm. it actually seemed like a much more natural fit than I ever would have imagined on those on those early days. So uh, describe a little bit about what you mean by that, that it kind of was in fitting with the theatrical lighting, like how how so? Well, so this would have been right around this would have been back in 96. And so, um, you know, there weren't a ton of lighting designers, architectural lighting designers at that point. And the ones there, a lot of the work that was getting done was um, not very colorful, um, very much about white light and lighting up spaces. Um, but what, um, you know, the founder of our company, Paul Gregory, was doing, he also came from theater. And that was his background before he moved into architecture. And he was exploring at, at, a, at sort of the perfect time, the use of color uh, in architectural lighting. And so, you know, he was lighting up um, large buildings like the Intel Tower in Chile um, for the first time with, with, with fixtures that could change color over time and create this sort of uh, different look that happened night overnight. And so that, and we brought that not just on our exterior designs, but you know the, the project I got hired for was Mohican Casino in Connecticut, and uh, very um, a, a very dramatic space um, with uh, a lot of different types of lighting fixtures and approaches, and treating it um, you know treating the design work very much like uh, we did in theater. You know we we're often thinking about not just like how you light, how you illuminate a space. Not you know we, we you, you can think about this raw foot candles in a space and a lot of uh, I think frankly a lot of people do think um, about that but we go a little further you know we're really thinking about what is the concept what is the big idea that an architect or an interior designer wants to get across to the people who experience that space and then how can we as lighting designers embrace that and help them across the finish line um, to get there. And we're thinking about first impression. We're thinking about how people feel when they mm -hmm. walk in the space. And all those things are what, that's what you do in theater. You know, like that's what you're trying, you're trying to get an audience to feel something. And so all those things just, it just made it a really easy transition for me to kind of move from theater into architecture. I would imagine there's a, an emotional element to the lighting that, I don't want to say that most architects don't think about, but it just adds another layer to the design beyond, you know, where the square footage breaks down and where the spaces are and where windows go, but to, to sort of intentionally shape that space differently based on how it's lit and what you're drawing attention to. And, um, what are some of the initial things that you think of? I mean, especially because we've never talked to a lighting designer on the show before, what are some of the just basic concepts that a lighting designer is thinking about as they're trying to understand what to do with a space? I mean, so where we start is that sort of big picture question for the architects is, is you know, we want to know, usually by the time we're brought on board a project, the architect has a, has a general idea of, of, of the type of space and the, the planning of it, and even some of the visual aspects of the design. And so what we 
instead of just jumping into the details of the lighting, we want to step back and hear what are the words that the owner of that space uh, gave the architect that led them to this design. We want to hear all that um, backstory. And we want to look for those, those design clues that will help us um, achieve kind of that emotional response that, that, that you were mentioning before. You know, I think there's, there's um, maybe it's not said out loud terribly often, maybe it's not thought about by all architects, but I, I think the really successful projects are the ones that can kind of pull at the, 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 the strings of people's emotions. And when they walk in and experience the space for the very first time, they feel something. Then they remember, then they remember it. And that's where I think a project becomes and really elevates itself and becomes successful. So we're just, we're looking for those clues. And then we work with the architect to kind of figure out, all right, if they want to get here with this design, how do we use light to maybe organize, visually organize a space, kind of create a composition so that someone's eye um, travels to the right things and not the things we don't want them to look at. Um, and um, of course, we we light the space so people can move around and they see the elements in it. That's uh, that's sort of bare minimum uh, a requirement on our work. But it, if we do our job right, we're really elevating um, that emotional response uh, in all the viewers and, and experiencers. That's really cool. In the last um, couple of years, I've really gotten into film and photography mm -hmm. and thinking about um, light, not just from an available light perspective, but a lot of film guys talk about shaping light and shaping a space with how it's lit. And, and you kind of alluded to this too. It's what you're drawing attention to, but also what you're drawing attention away from. So the things yeah. that you're, you're really guiding the viewer's eye into a space. And, um, I, I think that's just such an interesting concept that, you know, it's not just, we're taking this box and lighting it up so you can see all the elements, but you're really directing how somebody interacts with that space. You know, it's funny. It's, it's, um, we have a lot of control with light. I mean, you can turn the you can turn lights off and and people don't see anything. Turn lights on and, and they can. And there's all there's all the different levels in between. And but when you start thinking about like the composition of a restaurant, when you walk in, you get that first impression looking across the uh, the dining room. Um, it is a very clear collaboration um, between what we're bringing to the table from lighting and what the architect or the interior designer is doing. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is all you see is light. And so when you think about it like that, you don't see the beautiful velvet chair. You don't see the amazing painting behind the host. You don't even see the food. What you see is the light that comes out of the, the fixtures that we specify that hits and bounces off of all those items and then back into your eye, right? So the quality of the light and the, and the color and the reflectivity of the materials that we're lighting, they go hand in hand. And so we actually spend a lot of time educating architects and interior designers about that relationship so that they can understand maybe why we're we're like pushing them a little bit to all right, choose a material that helps make this thing that you're trying to achieve successful. Don't choose one that that's going to make our job harder. Um, and so there's a, there's a healthy, um, fun sort of give and take that happens in pretty much all of our collaborations like that. Yeah, I would imagine too that there are clients where uh, there's probably the development almost like scenes like you would have in a theater where different times of day, you need different lighting solutions. And what are some of the unique challenges of thinking through those kind of projects? Um, that happens actually quite often. And that's one of the reasons um, the way we think about light is in layers. Um, you know, the the simplest uh, lighting design is is probably in a lot of our bedrooms. You You walk in, you flip a switch, and you've got a ceiling mounted fixture in the center of, of your ceiling that turns on super bright, puts light, one light puts light everywhere. You have one layer, but it would be more interesting, and visually interesting and more helpful for you as an occupant of that bedroom if you had a bedside lamp on each side of the bed, you had a light in your closet. Maybe you have a light on the opposite side of your room on the dresser and 
you don't just turn on this one light that when you walk over the closet, you are now shadowed by your own body and you can't see the color of your suit that you're about to grab out. So you, you, you've you got these layers that are put light in the right place, um, but then they're also, and we can control, as lighting designers, we can control the brightness of each of these layers. And so, you know, like, like you were describing, we can basically set a scene and you can have one look for um, you know bedtime or trying to wind down at the end of the night. You could have a different look when you're trying to find your clothes in the morning. And that same approach is what we do for all of our projects. And we look for those opportunities, budget permitting, to be able to put those sort of layers in place to have that level of control and flexibility. So as you were going from a junior lighting designer to uh, the role that you're in now, including being a partner in the firm, uh, I would imagine there's more that you have to think about than just light lighting design. There's <laughs> all the, the business related aspects. What are sure. maybe some key learnings that you had along the way, or what are some things that you had to get better at or more experience, uh, to kind of earn your seat there as a, as a partner? No, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, I, I, I worked as a junior designer, probably about couple of years, two or three years, then started slowly designing my own projects. And I did that total for about five years, give or take. And um, I don't know if I don't know if Paul um, saw it, um, but, you know, I was starting to get a little itch that I, I was like, all right, maybe we want to try <laughs> something else. I wasn't quite sure. And he came to me and he said, you know, what, what if you what if you explore a little bit of the business side of what we do? And at first I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm a designer, you know, and, but I thought about it and I was like, you know, that could be an interesting little thing to try for a little while. And so I spent, um, I don't know, probably three or four years um, learning all the business aspects of what we do. So, you know, I, I uh, would start to learn how to set, set fees and estimate time for, for projects, um, how to manage that time once we handed a project over to uh, our designers and try to keep it, in check, so uh, so the the business can be profitable at the end of the day. Um, you know how to negotiate fees and write write proposals to our clients, um, and you know that was something I've never had to uh, never had to do. So, you know what what was a nice sort of break for, for me from design um, ended up being an incredibly valuable lesson um, in how to run a business and 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 do it successfully. Well, tell us a little bit about um, kind of the size and shape of the team. Like how, how many people are on the team? Are you guys all on site? Are you virtual spread out all over the place? Um, and what are some of the roles of that that team? Sure, sure. Um, so we have uh, we have one office. We're actually based in Harlem, uh, northern Manhattan. And um, our studio is made up of currently, I think we have 37 people. Um, so about uh, 25 designers. Um, and I think uh, seven or eight project managers and uh, fantastic admin staff uh, that do all the things non-lighting uh, that make us uh, actually tick. Um, and our design group, um, our design department is broken down into studios. And so a studio is run by a senior designer and um, working with them are some number of associate designers and junior designers. And together, that group of people basically shepherds a, a project um, from day one um, through the initial design work all the way through opening day. Uh, and so they are 100% responsible for that project uh, from beginning to end. Um, they're supported by, um, we, we have uh, three, uh, four actually design principals um, who are assigned to individual projects and oversee um, the work. And as a design principal, I will often meet with the client initially, make sure that we're sort of on the right track with the architect and interior designer. Um, I will certainly throw out a, a number of design ideas, but we really rely on the idea that the, the best idea rises to the top. And so it doesn't matter if it comes from me or if it comes from a junior designer who started a few weeks ago. The idea is if if it's a good idea, we we want to use it. And so we have this fairly we have very rich sort of collaborative in-house process. And then that's supported by our project management group. Um, a lot of what we do is very technical. Um, 
dealing with control, lighting control systems, dealing with different types of LEDs. And the fact that, um, you know, one of the things that's changed over the last 15 years is that um, we've moved from an incandescent lighting industry to an LED based lighting industry. And um, we would think that that would be easy, easier with all the benefits of LEDs and long life and all those things. But um, it's, it's as a lighting designer, it's actually a lot more difficult uh, to navigate all the all the things that are changing and being developed um, uh, in, in in the LED world. So um, those project managers help us stay on top of all that. Um, and while we're thinking about design, they're coming in and saying, "Hey, did you think about how to actually achieve that uh, from a from electrical standpoint or a control standpoint?" And then they help us with the the working with the electrical contractors on our projects that who install all the lighting that we specify and design. So we kind of all work together as a team, um, and uh, you know our projects are anywhere from you know probably the shortest is in the neighborhood of six months. Um, but we have long projects that last uh, multiple years, three, four years, um, that are quite large in size. So that's kind of the the lay of the land of our of our studio. So when it comes to some of the really technical pieces of it, the uh, you know how much power you're using, and you know my my probably pedestrian electrical brain is like, how many lights can I plug into this outlet or into this circuit? Are yep. those the kind of things? Are those things that you guys are responsible for too, or is that usually more on the uh, on a more technical engineering level. It's interesting. We, um, we are, we, we take responsibility for that. I think that's a little unusual in the lighting design world. I think a lot of lighting designers will come up with a design. They will draw it on a set of plans. They will show which things get want to, want to get turned on together, but that's kind of where they stop. Um, we figured out a number of years ago that it was frankly easier and faster for us to just take it the next few steps and figure out the, uh, the kind of uh, electrical engineering sort of, uh, side of what we design. And so that's what we do. We actually take it through, we, we design everything from the lighting control system all the way to the light fixture. Um, and so everything in between gets put on our drawings. And we've just found it's our our projects are more successful uh, when we do that, um, and they don't take more time for us to do. That's the ironic thing. <laughs> it's actually harder to go back and sort of check everyone else's work to make sure it matches what we intended. Well, I'm I'm sure this is something that you've come across too. But um, you were talking about some of the different challenges that LED present to your industry. Um, I was in a restaurant with some friends over the weekend and, you know, we were in one space that just felt really great. And I looked over in the next room over and I was like, the light just looks wrong in there. It is mm -hmm. just, just blasting. You know, there's like this great mood in the room we were in and the next room over, like almost had like this cafeteria vibe. It was just like, just blasted with too much light. Um, so the related question to this is I understand you're working on something that you've dubbed the restaurant project. Oh, and, yeah. and so maybe you're cataloging some things like this, but tell us a little bit about that and what that, what that project's about. Yeah, this is, this is actually something we, we completed before COVID, but it was, a, it was an initiative um, that we started. What we realized is we design a lot of restaurants. We're, we're known for our, our restaurant design work. And what, but what we realized is that we had a ton of opinions in house about how restaurant lighting should be designed, but we didn't have a lot of facts. And so, a number of years ago, we set out to basically do an in house um, study about restaurant design and really dig into things like the history of restaurant the history of the restaurant experience and the lighting within restaurants, looking at some of the psychological factors relating to that experience. And then um, we, we did a series of tests. Uh, we have a light lab uh, in our office. It's a double height space where we do tons of mock-ups and testing uh, with lighting. And we thought, great, we're gonna, we're gonna, we'll set up a couple tables. We will test different types of lighting for the dining table and what that experience is like. And we'll, we'll learn a ton and we'll, we'll, we'll document that down and share it with the rest of our crew. What we discovered, we went through all those steps and it was pretty successful, but what we realized is we kept coming back to the exact same things we always did. And we were like, you know, it's just, we need to look outside of what of our company. So we came up with this idea to literally go have dinner and experience what our, uh, the guests that we designed for experience in 50 of the top 
um, restaurants in New York City. Um, so we went on like Zagat and, and TripAdvisor and, 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 a, and a couple other sites and figured out what are the top um, 100 restaurants. We, we couldn't do 100. It was way too many. So we decided to do 50. <laughs> and we had, um, so two of us um, went to uh, each restaurant, sat down, had a meal. Um, we had a whole survey of different things to take a look at. You know, what was the first impression like? How bright is the lighting at the table? Um, does the guest face get washed with light or not? What's the candle look like? How does the food look? Um, on and on and on. And so we we literally surveyed these 50 restaurants in a very sort of complete way, brought it all back, sort of analyzed the data somewhat scientifically, not a completely scientific study, but it gave us a lot of information that I think we never would have seen if we were just sort of thinking in house, you know, there's some interesting takeaways, like, um, you know, if you go to fine dining restaurants in New York, one of the biggest critiques is it's too dark. Like how many times <laughs> I can't read the menu. People... I can't tell yeah, what this is. Right. If they pull, people pull out the, <laughs> their, their cell phone and the flashlight mm -hmm. so they can read the menu. And it's true. It is way, it is on like 78% of the restaurants that we went to. It was darker than what you know our industry standards would say it would need to be for a person of middle age. Never mind if it's someone a little older and their eyes, uh, you know, they just don't see as well in low light. Um, so that that was an that was an easy one that was definitely confirmed. We also now are you, know, you auditing we, this with a tool? Are you like yeah, putting a light meter yeah, we, out and seeing what the it, was, it, was, is it was a little geeky. We would sit down at these amazing restaurants and you know, we would try to um we would start pulling out our light meters and putting them on the table. And eventually we'd start getting weird looks from the, the waiters and waitresses. But pretty much anytime, <laughs> as long as we told them what we were doing, they're like, Oh, that's really interesting. And they never bothered us. It was fine. But yeah, we yeah, we um um we also looked at things like the first impression. Um and Actually, one of the things that came up in our research um, is th th this uh, psychological, um, uh, the, it's two psychologists, Kaplan and Kaplan, I think they were in the late 70s, early 80s, came up with this theory that uh, about how people experience um, spaces. And they called it, um, uh, let's see if I remember, um, co coherence and complexity. So the idea here's the idea is that when you walk into a space, you you need to be able to take it all in and understand the space around you. You don't want to be confused. You don't want to be you don't want to have so little light or identity that you're like, I don't understand what that is. Your brain is working too hard to figure out what you're experiencing. It wants to be easy and accessible for you. And then complexity. So if you walk into a space and there is interesting design around you, that there is something that is intriguing, that is unexpected, you are going to want, if you have those two things, when you walk into a space like a restaurant, you're going to want to keep exploring. Hmm. And so the, the fascinating thing that we thought about once we sort of stumbled across this, this idea was, this is really the designer's golden opportunity, the architects, the interior designers, the lighting designers, opportunity to set a restaurant's experience off on the right foot. People walk in, they haven't experienced the service yet. They haven't tasted the food. All they have is what we give them as designers. And if we can deliver that positive first impression, there's a much better chance that the rest of the evening, if the rest of the restaurant experience is good, is gonna be a positive and memorable one. And that's, you know, that's what restaurant tours trade on, mm -hmm. is they want people to come in, they want to have a great time. They want them to remember it and recommend it to their friends, put it on Instagram. That's how they get more business. So it was it was a really fascinating study um, that sort of put us in more, took us in more directions than we ever thought um, when we first started it. Yeah, that's really interesting. We've, we've talked a lot about restaurant design in particular. Uh, I'm curious what some of your favorite types of projects to work on right now include. It's interesting. It's... Um, it's changed over time. Like when I first started designing, um, I was kind of excited about, about it all, but I really gravitated towards like large exterior designs, big moves, you know, paint colored light in, a, in an artistic way on the outside of a building. Um, 
I think it kind of took me back to when I was designing for dance, uh, when I was when I was a young theatrical student, um, and you had these big moves on stage, uh, where basically as a lighting designer, you were basically in total control of, of the scenery and what it looked like. Um, and that was kind of what was fun about doing large exterior designs. But I think as I've gotten older, um, I've actually started to appreciate, um, we've, we've actually developed um, a wonderful working relationship with a local science center um, to New York, Liberty State, uh, Liberty Science Center, which is over in Jersey City, uh, New Jersey. We've been working with them for five or six years. Um, and, you know, we do a number, they have a wonderful in-house design team, and um, we do a number of relatively small projects. Um, each of their exhibits is 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 pretty small and, and compact, but you're getting to teach 13 year olds about science. And we get to play a part in making that experience come alive and getting them excited about um, all, you know, all, all different topics of, uh, of science and, and STEM uh, learning. And so, excuse me, I think, you know, I get the most joy out of doing those type of projects these days where there's this opportunity to teach um, and to educate people, you know, not just about lighting, but, you know, anything that they, they want to learn. If I can help with that, that's, um, that's fun for me. It's cool when your the, your own professional interests and the things that you get excited about is something that you can kind of teach a bigger concept through that. Yeah. Um, what would you say is maybe one of your proudest professional moments so far? Oh, um, well, you know, I think we have a tendency as designers to not really appreciate the impact of what we can do. Um, we design the lighting for um, Clyde Warren Park. Um, this is down in Dallas. Um, and it's uh, it's an interesting project because it was um, a park that was built over the top of a subterranean freeway. If you know Dallas, there's Woodall Rogers Freeway, which basically cuts this sort of divide between a bunch of neighborhoods, including this neighborhood called Uptown and the Arts District. Um, and so this idea was developed of, well, the, why don't we deck over the highway? and create five or six acres worth of park area and kind of reconnect these two long disconnected neighborhoods. So um, we were brought on board by um, OJB, the office of James Burnett. They were the landscape uh, designers for the project. Um, we designed the project. Um, one of the things we did is we, we wanted to go down and do a mock-up um, in Dallas on the site. We were testing a number of things that we wanted the owner and the architect to see some tree lighting and a number of the other features. So we're down there and it's, you know, it's middle of summer. So it's like 10 o'clock at night. Um, uh, uh, and there is nobody in this neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, it is uh, scary how few people were there. And it was just surprising um, that the neighborhood was that kind of dead at that time of night. So fast forward, we finished the project. It opened. Um, as we always do, we sort of go back and start on the next project and keep going. And I was in Dallas about, I don't know, two or three years later, giving a talk uh, at a lighting show. And after the talk, the folks said, let's go get a bite to eat. They, they picked a restaurant that was right on the edge of, of the park. Um, and there were no restaurants on the edge of the park when, when we had designed it and built it. So we had dinner, walked outside. Again, same about the same time of night, like 9.30 at night, dark out. The park is packed with people and not just adults, you know, coming from a show or the restaurant, kids, little kids playing in the water features at 930 at night. And it just sort of dawned on me that like, you know, the little thing we did about adding light to this experience for these two neighborhoods allowed them to have this sort of after dark experience that, I, you know, until that time, I never appreciated how much it changed those neighborhoods and and sort of improved it for for the residents and and the people who come and visit it. That was um, th that was one of the more surprising and also rewarding uh, things I've experienced. It's almost like a cultural impact. You're you know, it's not only changed 
the hours that people are there. But like you said, there weren't restaurants nearby before because nobody wanted to be there or wasn't attracting people, didn't have to draw. And right. it's pretty wild to have that kind of impact. Yeah, it was fun. Um, any design heroes, any folks that you either kind of looked up to as you're coming up in the business or people you look up to currently? Well, um, you know, I wouldn't be where I am without, um, my mentor, uh, and now my business partner, Paul Gregory. Um, he's, uh, I, I cannot think of a better designer, businessman, educator, uh, and all, an all around amazing guy. Um, so huge kudos to, to him for helping me along. I think when I sort of think back on my early days, um, when I was in college and I was really trying to, I was sort of thrown into this world of design that I really didn't understand. And I was trying to sort of like, all right, what does this mean to be a, a theatrical designer? And I, you know, it's before the internet. So, you know, th my research was done by going to the library and, and checking out books and, I, I had picked up a bunch of books, um, which include scenic designs by this, this guy, Michael Jurgen. Um, and Michael had a lot of amazing, like Broadway and, and other design work. And I, I, I kept looking at it. And I was look, I really admired the lighting. And then I started realizing he was crediting the other members of the team. And he kept, I kept seeing the name Jennifer Tipton. And I was like, who is this person? And um, come to find out, Michael was a professor at Yale at the time. And so was Jennifer. And mm -hmm. so they worked together a ton as scenic designer and lighting designer. Um, you know, so I started doing a little bit of reading and I, you know, I read the trade magazines and her name kept coming up. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. So who, let me figure out, you know, and you start to understand the sense of like what her style was. And it was very much inspired by nature about sun and the, the light from a blue sky, you know, that soft blue light that you get that you would almost never perceive, but is always there. And, and just very connected to how natural light works. And she brought that into a lot of her, uh, a lot of her design work. And I really kind of connected with that very early on. Um, the funny thing was, is that my, I went to Central Connecticut State University um, uh, and not too far from Hartford, um, Connecticut, where uh, they have one of the more successful regional theaters in the area called Hartford Stage. And so we would get hired to go set up lighting for their shows. And so I got jobbed in to, to set up lighting for Julius Caesar. And I'm up in the grid and we're, 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 we're setting all the light fixtures and um, the in comes the designer uh, to sort of direct us on aiming the light fixtures. And I look down and it's Jennifer. And now, now I'm nervous. Now I'm freaking <laughs> out that I'm about to aim lights um, for this person who I've only read about and sort of admired from afar. And I was lucky enough to, you know, we, we did the aiming and I got to sat, sit in the theater while she cued the show. And it was amazing to watch her work, like just the subtlest change in light, which she was able to control the emotion um, uh, of the audience. Um, she was able to control, like we talked about before, where the audience was looking just by a small change in color or brightness. Um, it was inspiring. Um, and, you know, I've, I've never met her, um, but I, she's still around and actually she, she did this, um, sort of solo thing, um, uh, a few months ago and she was featured in the New York times. I remember reading the article and I was really excited to see it. And she had a quote, it went something like 99.9% um, uh, of the audience um, doesn't uh, appreciate the, the lighting. They, 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 don't, uh, they don't understand how it affects, but 100% of them are affected by it. Mm. And it's, it is so true. Um, and that's true, not just for theater, but it's true in what we do in architecture too. Um, so I don't know. I credit her and 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 her sort of design inspiration for some of my early early thinking about how you use light um, and and sort of that natural approach. Yeah, I love that quote. I think that's uh, that probably applies to lots of design out there. Yeah. Like the <laughs> noticed True. probably more noticed in its absence than it is <laughs> that you're experiencing it uh, or being impacted by it. Um, maybe this is a good segue. Uh, we ask everybody who's ever been on this show, 
what they are most obsessed with. And for you, this could be something in life or work or anything else, but I'm curious what you find you are most obsessed with right now. Well, I don't know that this is something that changes much over time, but uh, we're pretty obsessed with this idea of testing out and mocking up what we propose. Mm -hmm. um, it's I mentioned our light lab before, which is sort of our it's it's our, it's our theater. It's our thing where it's our space where we 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 have tons of different light fixtures. We have all these samples of materials. We have a shop downstairs where we can build different pieces of architecture for testing. And the reason we do that is because, you know, you'd think, you know, a number of us have been with working lighting designers for, you know, a decade or more. You would think, oh, well, you guys are the experts. You don't need to test. Why do you need to keep testing this? And the interesting thing is that, you know, we're working with architects and interior designers who are pushing boundaries. They're using more new materials and colors and finishes that are unusual and maybe have never been tried before or, or haven't been tried in a specific kind of uh, configuration. So, you know, we try to not leave too much to chance. You know, we want to know for our own benefit that what our crazy idea, if our crazy idea is, is actually going to look great on the project. So we do it for us, but, you know, we, we also spend a lot of time educating our architect interior designer that we work with and you know i have a saying in the office seeing is believing you know i can i can take photoshop and uh, or a 3d rendering tool and and show you what the lighting is going to look like but until you see it with your own eyes with the material that you specified you're not really going to be you're not going to believe it and you're not going to be sure that we've got it solved so you know, like when we design a hotel, for example, we'll we'll actually ask the interior designer to bring their material and finish samples into our light lab. And so we'll light it with the actual light that we're going to propose so they can see what their own materials are going to look like. You know, and, and half the time they'll look at it and go, oh, that's not quite what I was expecting. And so mm -hmm. then they'll try two or three, two or three more things and it's kind of fine tune their design based on the lighting that's actually going to be there. But, you know, we also do it for the owners. You know, they're spending a lot of money. They may or may not have a lot of experience about thinking about lighting. And, you know, we want them to not worry about it. We want them to be confident that we've got their back, that the place is going to look fantastic. And, um, you know, or, you know, we might be pushing them to spend a little bit more money than they're comfortable with. And sometimes we have to bring them in and show them, all right, this is what you're going to get if you only spend this much. But if you spend a little bit more, see how much better it looks. And sometimes, again, just seeing it with your own eyes makes that sell um, a whole lot easier. So this is something we push for on every project. We're kind of nuts about it. And, um, you know, we think it's what in a large part makes us successful at, at what we do as light designers. So a lot of my uh, clients in the past have been branding and design clients uh, who are architects and interior designers. And it's, you know, seeing the interior designer space that they have inside the offices with all the chips and all the mm. sample books. And um, their lab is always the thing that I walk by. Like, I could take a couple of days off and just come over here and play. <laughs> like yeah. your lighting lab sounds like something I would also enjoy just to hang out and, and play for a little bit. <laughs> Next time I'm in New York, I'll hit you up. Come on over. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to kick Glad me Glad to have you. <laughs> well, hey, um, before we wind down here, I'm curious if you have a favorite piece of advice, either favorite piece of advice to pass along to your team or maybe favorite piece of advice that you've received. Oh, interesting. Um, well, I, you know, something that's actually stuck with me, um, I, I think I heard this on a, on a radio broadcast last year. And it was something that really, really struck me. And I think it's very appropriate for anyone who's kind of in my position where you're sort of looking after a, a, a team of people is, um, you know, take care of yourself so that you can take care of them uh, and take care of your peeps. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've played the role of uh, uh, almost everything that, that, uh, our folks do in our company, everything from, you know, early designs and drafting to invoicing. And so it's really 
easy for me to step in and go, oh, I'll help. I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll do some CAD work and I'll, and, and, you know, this one little piece of advice that I heard was sort of a nice reminder of, you know, that's not what they need from you right now. What they need is you to be there to solve the problem or to, to, you know, to soothe a client who has a concern or to, you know, make sure they stay on, on track timing wise and, or even just, you know, taking care of myself, you know, you know, just mentally and just so I'm in the right place um, and not exhausted. And so it was, that was a really helpful reminder to me to uh, that, that you know as your roles change um as you move up through the ranks in a company when you get to the place where i'm at you got to take care of your peeps you got to be in a good enough spot that you can do that yeah that's great advice um before we let you go uh tell our listeners where they could track down uh you online or learn more about focus lighting yeah, sure. Um, you can check out some of the projects we've done or or get in contact with us about helping out with the project or even apply to work for our team at focuslighting.com. Um, and then we're also on Instagram um, at focuslightingnyc. Excellent. Well, Brett, it's been a pleasure chatting with you today and to learn uh, more about lighting design in particular. Uh, it's been an awesome pleasure. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate having, having me on. Yeah, thanks for being on the show and thank you for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 174 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. Add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.